So we got a little bit of homework too, eh? So let's have a look at that. It's that sheer stuff. So 361 and 362 are a lot alike. I mean, y'all, we could look at one or the other. It doesn't really matter to me. I mean, there's 361. Okay, so we could have a look at this if, uh, if that works. All right, so this is a procedure. You know, it's a, a series of, of steps that you need to go through to, to get this worked out here. So let's have a look. All right, so what you're going to do on this is you're going to, we want to find the uh, maximum overall shear stress for the beam, and that's 3V over 2A. V is V max. And then we also, we want to find the uh, shear stress at points B, which is uh, 2 meters from A, and then on that cross section, points 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right. And that's going to be found using that VQ over IT formula. So uh, what we got to do here is find uh, V at B, and we got to find V max, and you got to find Q, and that's equal to the area that would shear off times the distance from the neutral axis to its centroid. And then you got to find I for the whole beam, and you got to find the thickness of the beam and the area of the beam. So that's what you need. So let's kind of walk through that. So what you're going to do here first is find the reactions. You know, you always want to be doing that. So, so you can go ahead and, and do that. So what we would do here is we would take some moments about one or other of the uh, supports. So I probably took a moment about A there. I'm going to have 800 by 6. So that's 800 newtons per meter by 6 meters. 2, 2, and 2 makes 6. That gets me 4,800 uh, newtons. And then the centroid of that distributed load is three meters over. <clears throat> so that would put that total load about there, and that's three meters over. And so 4,800 times three, that's negative. It's clockwise. And then also we've got the 1,200, which is four meters over. So minus 1,200 times 4, and then plus 6RC. Okay, 6RC is uh, counterclockwise, so that's positive. That loads clockwise, as is the total load there. So RC is 3,200. And then I want to be careful on these reactions, because a lot's going to depend on it. So what I went ahead and did was take moments about the other side, about C, and did that. This is kind of a another moment equation there. So 800 by 6 by 3. This time it's positive because that one's coming around this way. And then 1200 times 2 is positive and then minus 6 RA. So I got RA was 2800. And then I just did a sum of FY as a check. 2800 up minus 800 times 6 minus 1200 plus 3200. It should be 0 and it is. So, so that checked out. Okay. So some of MA, some of MC, and some of FY to check. So I'm pretty sure I got the proper reaction. So. All right. So then what happens is I'm at zero. I want to get a shear diagram going here. I'm going to jump up by the reaction up to 2,800. Then I'll find the area. And I went ahead and found the area to the left of the 1,200 load. 
so that's negative. Downward load, 800 by 4, so that's negative 3,200. So that gets me from 2,800 down to negative 400. Okay, then I've got the uh, 1,200 load. That pushes me down from negative 400 down to negative 1,600. Then I've got negative 800 by 2. That's negative 1,600 more down to negative 3,200. And then the 3,200 pushes me back up to zero. So there's the shear diagram. Okay. All right. So what I can do is find the biggest shear, and V max is right there, negative 3,200. The negative really has got nothing to do about what the maximum is. It's kind of an absolute value kind of thing. And then I've got, uh, I want to find the shear right there. So I'm at 2,800, and then I'm dropping by a slope of 800 over a two meter span there. So that gets me down to 1,200 at B. So VB is 1,200. And then I want to get I, and that's just a rectangle. So it's I for the entire rectangle. Base times the height cubed over 12. And that's 1.71 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the 4. And then the thickness is 0.04 meters. So I've got V, V max. I got uh, I and T. Okay. So that's what I get out of that. So we got any questions on what I've got here so far? Yeah. Um, so VB and VMAX, I guess I'm just a little confused. With each of these, it changes, but I'm not quite sure what you're seeing that tells you this is VB. Okay, what I'm doing to f find VB is I'm finding the spot on the, mo on the shear diagram that's at point B. Point B is two meters over from A. So I'm up there at 2,800 at A. That's the shear at A. Then I drop by this slope. The slope of the shear diagram is the value of the distributed load. So I'm two, going two meters over at a slope of 800. So that drops me by two times 800 by 1,600. So what I'm doing there, I'm finding the value of the, this diagram, the shear at point B. So, is that good? Okay. So that's the shear that occurs at point B. Okay. Other questions? All right, now what I want to do is find Q, and I want to do it for different points here because I want to find the shear at points B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5. So I just go through and do that. So what Q is is the area that would shear off if the beam failed times the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area. So why don't we work from the bottom up here. So if the beam shears at point 3, it's going to split in half right in the middle there at point 3. Okay, so the top would shear off. Remember these beams, when they, when they fail through shear, they split laterally. Just think of taking a deck of cards in your hand between your thumb and your fingers and just bending it. And think about how those cards slide. That's what we're talking about there for a shear failure. Okay, it's not like a bolt where you shear it off. It's different. It's a lateral type shear. So you could certainly fail at the centroid. You know, that, that's a very common way that you can have a shear failure. There we go. So right there, that's what we're talking about for shear failure. When you bend those beams, those planes want to slide. You know, if the material's not strong enough to hold together, they will slide there. They'll slip, okay? So that's what we're talking about there. Okay, so if that were to fail right at the centroid, the top half could be said to shear off of the bottom half. 
So the area that would shear off would be 0.04 times 0.04 it would be 0.0016 square meters. Okay, because the top half of that beam would slide with respect to the bottom half. Okay, so that's A. And then the distance would be from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area. That area has a height of four centimeters, so that distance would be half of four would be two. Okay, so what we're doing there is finding um, that there, there's a two centimeter distance there, 0.02 meters. Okay, that's from the neutral axis to the centroid of the area. And then I just multiply the area that would shear off times that distance, and I get 32 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. So that's that Q, fit Q term. Area that would shear off times the distance from the neutral axis to its centroid. Okay. Got any questions on that? All right, now we can do it for point two. If that beam fails at point two, that top part will slide with respect to the bottom. So the top part will shear off. So what you've got then for the area is four centimeters by two centimeters, 0. 0.0008 meters squared. The distance from the neutral axis to that centroid is gets two centimeters, so gets you up to the base of the area. Half the height of two will be one more so it's 0.03 meters from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area. Multiply those two together, you get 24 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. And up on the top there, there's no area that would shear off. So there's no shear up there. Okay, there's no area. Area is 0. So the distance times the area is 0. So Q is zero for that point on the very top. The area is zero. There's no area that would shear off. Okay. So those are Qs for points one, two, and three. Points four and five will be very similar to what I'm doing here. Okay. It's a symmetrical kind of deal. You use a negative distance. Um, we don't, I just never mess with signs on this, so you don't need a negative distance, really. I don't know, there might be some overall connection of signs that will get you the, the sign on the shear uh, stress, but I've never really employed it, and I've not seen other people do it either, so I don't think you really got to worry about it. Okay, so now you just combine everything. We got V, we got Q, we got I, we got T. So it's just a matter of putting it all together. So, um, so the shear at B1 is just zero. There's no uh, Q factor up there. So that zeroes out. And then 1200 is the shear for each case. The I is the same for each case, 1.71 times 10 to the minus six. And the thickness is the same for each case. And so you just plug in the different Q's. So at point 2, Q is 24 times 10 to the minus 6. And at point 3, Q is 32 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. So that'll get you the uh, shear stresses at those different points. And I've got a little sketch of the shear distribution over there. The, the shear maximizes at the neutral axis. Any, uh, any questions on that? So, so that's the process there, okay? VQ over IT.
Okay. A lot easier to find tau max. You just take 3 times V divided by 2 times the total area of the beam. The way I think about that is the maximum shear force off the shear diagram divided by the area of the whole beam gets you the average shear, and then you're multiplying that up by 3 halves, and that gets you the maximum shear, uh, 1,500,000. So that's all you got to do to find the maximum. Any questions on that? Okay, you still got to do points uh, four and five on that. They're you know they're very similar, so it's not that uh, you know it's pretty straight up. Three sixty two is very much like that. Just you know you're just finding one shear value, so it's, you know similar process. So just get that process figured out. Now we got shear flow here to do this one. What you want to do, you're going to look at one flange shearing off. Okay, so you're going to look at what happens if that top flange shears off. So what you're going to do there is find what's called shear flow. VQ over I. So I is the moment of inertia for the whole beam there, the entire beam. So what I'm doing is, is being as that's a symmetrical I beam, I'm going to use the total moment of inertia for the base of 888 and 8 makes 24 and a height of 18. So I'm using that value at 24 and this value of 18. So 24 times 18 cubed over 12. And then I'm going to subtract off these cutouts here on either side. Okay. And that's 8 by 0 0.12 high. Cube that and divide it by 12. There's two of them. You take them away. You can only do that because the centroid of each of those figures is right on the neutral axis. Okay. So that's why I'm employing that method. There's no AD squared terms for the entire beam nor for the cutouts. So that's why I can do it that way. If you have a situation where that is not the case, if you have a T beam, let's say, or an L beam, or something like that, you can't do that method. It, it don't work, okay? So just, just only employ that method when it's a very symmetrical beam. That's the only time it works. So I went ahead and found I, 0. 0.00009360. Okay. Um, then I went ahead and found the shear. I did a little shear diagram. I've got 2,000 for the shear. And then I went ahead and found Q. All right. So what I got going on here for Q is I look at one flange shearing off because what I'm investigating here is how much force will build up in a nail or screw and the screws holding the top flange on. So what I'm doing there is I'm going to find the tendency of that top flange to shear off with that with the Q factor there. So I find the area of the top flange it's 24 centimeters wide by 3 high. So 0.24 times 0.03 gets me 0 0.0072. And then I find the distance from the neutral axis to the center of the flange. Half a 12 and half a 3. That's the distance. So 6 and 1 and a half gets me 7 and a half. So that's the distance from the neutral axis to the center of the flange. So I take the area times that distance, and that's 0 0.00054 cubic meters. So that's Q for the flange. Okay. 
and then I run that shear formula for it, and it's F, lowercase f is VQ over I. I don't have any T here. See, the T, if I were doing the full shear formula, the T would be right there. But see, that that's not solid material in there. It's a, two boards kind of spliced together with screws. So that thickness isn't there. It's not doing anything, you know. It, it's not providing any strength. Instead of using that thickness, I'm using a screw now. So that's why the T is not in that formula. Because it, it, it's, there is no T. Okay. All right, so I find 11,540 newtons of force build up per meter. And then I take that times the spacing on the screws. 0 0.06 meters, so I've got 692 newtons in each screw. So are we okay with that? Any questions on that bit? So it's just like doing that shear with VQ over IT, except you got no T. So you take the T out. And what you're getting there is the force per unit length along the beam. Okay. You got any questions? We're good. Yeah. All right, so that, that's uh, the stuff that's due tomorrow. Now, start getting your homework back uh, this week. I'm a little backed up here, but I'm working through things, so I'll try and get it back to you by Friday so you'll have all of it. I'll get you a final review maybe tomorrow. Okay. It's already on in Moodle, you know, it's, it's there if you want to look at it. Okay. Why don't we look at one other thing here with shear? We got a bit of time. Now there's something called shear center. And you know, I forgot to bring my uh, little C-beam here with me, but we actually have shear that flows through beams, okay? You can almost think of it like a fluid flowing through a beam. And that can cause you some trouble sometimes, so. Um, let's say we've got a, uh, a C-channel here that we're using as a beam. And let's say we the centroid's over here somewhere. I don't know where it'd be, but let's say we load it up over the centroid. That can cause us a little bit of problem here because what happens is that shear flows through that beam and it acts kind of like this. And the reactive shear then creates this situation where this flange will bend down a little bit because of our load. And that will kind of go into a pattern a little bit like that. Okay. When you load that up, you'll warp it a little bit. Even though you, you can even apply the load at the centroid and still have that effect occur. As I'm showing you there on the left. Okay. And that, that can be real problems because that can throw things kind of out of alignment. We don't mind if things have a nice even bending, kind of like a diving board down. Normally speaking, you can deal with something like that pretty well on a structure or whatever it is you're building. But this kind of twisting, warping action can be problems. And so there's a solution to that. And the solution to that problem of having something bend kind of and twist and wrap up like that is to place the load at a location where you balance out this shear flow. So if you actually take that load and offset it to the left, you'll balance that tendency of it to warp to the right and get a nice, even, clean bend out of it so it's not twisting up. Okay. 
And I even remember somebody telling me, uh, and this is getting to be a little bit old technology here, but one of the truck companies made their frames out of C-channel for their big trucks. And I can't remember which company that was. Chevy or Dodge, I think. I don't think it was Ford. And what they, you know, and the problem was if they put their motor mounts right on top of the frame, they got this type of action, which really kind of screwed things up in the, for how the engine was sitting. So if you look at the motor mounts on these, and these, I don't think they do it this way anymore. I think they kind of use tube now. But if you look at these old trucks, they actually put motor mounts on them on the inside of that C-channel to put the load there. And what they've done, they've done a little bit of shear center calculations here is what they call it. And the intent of that was to avoid the bending you see there on the left, which, which could cause some, some problems there, okay? So what we'd like to know here is how far over do we put this load from the centroid so that we get a nice even bend instead of a twisting kind of warping bend like that. And this is a shear center calculation is what it is. Okay. Now this is a little bit empirical here, um, but let's just kind of walk through this. This is a little bit messy going through this, but we'll just walk it through. All right. So let's say we got a channel beam here, and they use C channels sometimes. They face off buildings with them because they got a nice flat edge here. As I say, they used to use them in certain truck frames. So that's called a C channel there. Obviously, it looks like a C. Let's figure out how far over to load this particular C channel so that we don't get any twisting of that C channel beam. Okay. So what's going to happen here, you're going to have a downward shear doing that, but that will kind of continue on into a pattern like that and of shear, and that's what causes the twisting in the C channel. All right, so we, what we're going to want to do is calculate the moment that that causes, because that's what creates the twist. Actually, it's the reaction to that that causes the twist, but, but that's kind of the idea there, okay? So let's go ahead and figure up some stuff about this. Now, if we want to find the moment of inertia of this beam, we're probably going to need that. So we got 24 by 24 centimeters. So I'm going to take a full box there and see the centroid of that box is right there, which is right on the neutral axis. So I can go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to subtract off the cutout. And same thing with the cutout. The centroid for the cutout is right on the neutral axis, too. So the cutout's like right there. Now, its centroid will be a little further over. I'm a little bit out of scale there, but it's over there. So it's, but it's right on the neutral axis. So I can go ahead and do this little subtraction trick on this one. The two types of beams you can't do it for are L-beams L and uh, T-beams. Neither of those will work. But... Um, generally speaking, you can use this little trick for, uh, for I-beams that are symmetrical and for C's if they're symmetrical too. Okay, so I'm doing the outer BH cubed over 12 minus the inner cutout BH cubed over 12, and I get 0 0.0002506 meters to the 4. So we got we good with that so far. All right, so they're kind of the, the shear patterns on those things. I've got the shear flow marked, plus I have the distribution of shear um, on those different parts of that C channel. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find a point where two of those shear flows intersect right there. I'm going to take moments about that point to figure out what that torsion is that twists that shaft up on account of that shear flow. That's how I'm going to approach this. So 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take moments about this. I'm going to eliminate, by doing that, I'm going to eliminate two of the shears. They intersect through my point A. So the shear I'm going to worry about, the shear flow is that right there in that lower flange. So what I'm going to do is find VF equals VQ over I for the lower flange of that C channel. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to integrate this because I've got a varying shear distribution on it. So it's going to get a little bit uh, into some calculus here. But remember, my Q is A times D. My D is from the neutral axis down to the centroid of that thing. And that's half of the 12, 6, plus half of the 6, which is 3. So that's 9, 0.09 meters. And then the area of the thing will be 0.06, which is the thickness of that flange, times the distance x that I'm working my way over. So it's 0.06 times whatever x is. So the q for that flange of the beam as I work my way across is 0.0054 times x, x being the distance I'm coming across. Okay. So now if I want to find that shear flow, I'm going to take my V off of the shear diagram, okay? So that's just whatever I pull off my shear diagram. This calculation I'm doing here is independent of, um, of whatever the shear is. I just pull that off the shear diagram. I got Q, which is 0.00054x. So that's Newtons for the V and meters cubed for the Q. And then I divide that by 0 0.0002506 meters to the 4, which is I. Okay. And if I combine all that stuff together, I get whatever V is off of the shear diagram times 21.55 times whatever X is. And the units are Newtons per meter. Okay. So that's the shear flow there for any value of X as I work my way across that lower flange. Now what I want to do is add this up, see, because the shear flow is varying as I work my way across. So I'll integrate it to add it up from 0 to 0.21 to find the shear force in the lower leg. Now I'm doing 0.21 for a reason here. And this is somewhat just an estimate here. This is empirical. It's not a perfect thing we're doing here. What's up is we've got our channel here. We have to kind of decide what's the flange and what's the web. And we're going to be, we're going to just make a decision on that. And our decision is going to be right there in the middle of the web there. That's as far over as we consider the flange to go. So we're going to start at zero and go to 0.21 meters. That's what we're calling the flange. And it's just halfway into the web is what it is. Okay. And that's where that 0.21 comes from. All right, so what I've done here, I've taken the F and made it uppercase for force because I'm going to find the shear force in that lower leg by doing this integration, by adding up the shear flow. So I'm going from 0 to 0.21 times what I got for lowercase f. I just integrate it. The V is whatever number I get off the shear diagram, so I can pull that out of the integral. And I got 21.55x, so that's 10.77x squared integrated from 0 to 21. So I plug in my values for x, and I get the shear force is 0 0.4752 times whatever the shear off the shear diagram is. Okay. So we do all right with that. 
So that's that sheer force down there in that lower flange. So now we're going to find the moment that's caused by that. So we got that sheer float force coming there. 0.45, excuse me, 0.4752 times whatever the shear off the shear diagram is. So we multiply that by a moment arm. That thing's working its way through the lower flange. We're going to go from our point A here, which we chose because it uh, intersects with two of these reactive shears. Okay. So by taking moments about A, we eliminate those from the moment equation. So we got that. that. So we're going to go 0.18 meters down to, from the A down to the middle of the bottom flange. That's our moment arm times that value of shear, and it's 0.08554 times V. So what we'll do here next is we're going to figure out where to put this load. See, we want to know how far over to put it to balance out that torquing action. So I'm going to put the whole load right at that offset at there, a distance E. So that moment will be V times E, and that'll equal the moment that I just calculated. That's going to counterbalance it is what it's going to do. So the V's will cancel, so E is 0 0.08554 meters, which is 8.554 centimeters. So if this is a, let's say you're working for one of those truck companies and you're figuring this out, you're going to put a motor mount on there that's going to go 8.554 centimeters at least over for, uh, from um, this, that center point A which is in the center of this uh, web here, web six. So in the center of the web means it's three from the edge. So that little bracket there is going to have to extend at least 5.554 centimeters to the left. You're going to load the thing up there. That will counterbalance that twisting action, and everything should be nice and squared up and, and clean. Okay. A little bit involved there, but that's the, the deal. I, I hear you get some of this second year, so I just thought I'd cover it. Okay. It's called shear center. So are we doing all right with that? I'll get you just one of these to do. Um, I suggest just getting, you know, getting this example we just worked throughout while you do this other problem. It's, it's a process again. It's kind of step by step working through it. About 372. And now we got our final coming up on Tuesday from 2.30 to 4.30, I think. So um, we'll just make this do Tuesday. That'll be the 12th. We'll cover it here at some point this week pretty well for you, so you get an idea of how to do it. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that now the final should be Tuesday at uh, two thirty to four thirty, and then also, I think I'll have a Wednesday evening session for online students. I think I'll do it that way. So, um, so just so you all know. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that tomorrow a bit. I think.